now transitioning uh, to our third uh, uh, speaker uh, of today, uh, Dr. Heidi Ellis, uh, who is the director uh, of the Refugee and Trauma Resilience Center. Dr. Ellis is an associate professor in psychology and psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital and a licensed clinical psychologist. She is also the director of the Refugee Trauma and Resilience Center at Boston Children's Hospital, a partner in the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Dr. Ella's primary focus is on understanding and promoting refugee youth mental health and well being, with particular emphasis on understanding how trauma, exposure, violence, and social context impact developmental trajectories. Over the past 15 years, she has conducted a community-based practitioner research program with the Somali youth and was a principal investigator in multi-site longitudinal research project examining developmental pathways to and away from violence, including ideological violence, gang involvement, and constructive civic engagement. She also co-leads the multidisciplinary expert resource group with Stephen Wine and Eric Rosanne on the topic of repatriation and reintegration of children from formerly ISIS controlled territories and is, and is co-developer of the trauma treatment model, trauma system therapy. Um, Dr. Heidi, the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you to ACTRI for the opportunity to speak here today and for everyone who is taking time out of their schedule to listen. <clears throat> um, I think as is clear from the diverse expertise on this panel and what we've already heard, the issue of repatriation and reintegration cuts across many different levels, from legal to policy to practice. Um, what I want to focus on with my bit of time here today is on thinking very specifically about the child, the experience of a child who has lived under ISIS and how we as members of civil society or governments can try to help them move forward. Children live <clears throat> within layers of what developmental psychologists refer to as the social ecology. This means they live in families, they go to schools, they have neighborhoods, communities, and a larger society around all of that that shapes the laws and culture um, in which they live. I think of these layers of the social ecology as providing the basic scaffolding that we depend on, that we expect as, um, to help us in raising healthy, well-functioning children and ultimately citizens. But we know from decades of child development research that disruptions in any one layer of the social ecology can have profound implications for the developing child at its core. <clears throat> in a situation like ISIS, every one of these layers of the social ecology has been disrupted. At the societal level, children were exposed to ongoing conflict and war, public executions, and widespread resource deprivation. Schools, normally a place of safety, instead integrated in the K through 12 curriculum, um, the whole curriculum was imbued with violence so that even a math class used images of bombs or destruction to illustrate mathematical concepts. Within the family, some kids may have experienced their parents as protectors, but for others, the parents themselves may have been sources of threat. We know that in um, situations of conflict, domestic violence and child abuse increases and we also know that children regularly experience loss or separation from parents or witness their parents be terrified and helpless or victims of violence themselves. So unquestioningly, we need to grapple with this question. What does this mean for the developing child at the core of such a horrific social ecology? And what does that mean for successful reintegration and rehabilitation? So to answer this question, I think we need to think about the ways in which our brains have evolved to manage threat. I'm not going to go too deep into uh, neurobiology here, but 
it is true that our brains are exquisitely designed to promote survival in the face of threats. Why humanity is still around, um, <clears throat> even through a pandemic. When we experience trauma, there are shifts in our emotions, our behaviors, and how we perceive and process both ourselves and the world around us. So these changes are incredibly adaptive when we're faced with real danger. They help us to survive. But when a child lives in an environment of chronic or severe threat, the brain systems that perceive and respond to threat can become potentiated, meaning that they begin to respond as if there's a true threat, even in settings that are relatively safe. What this means is that you can take a child out of an unsafe setting like ISIS or al Hol and reintegrate them to a much safer context, but their brains may continue to respond to minor stressors in the environment as if their survival is at stake. These shifts in emotion, behavior, and cognition can lead to what we call developmental cascades that interfere with a child's ability to adapt and thrive even in safe settings. Okay, so think for a minute now about the social ecology of a child who's being repatriated to whatever country. It's tempting to think that simply transporting the child to a new safer society means that the biggest part of the job is done, that development will now unfold in a healthy way. But if a child's developing brain has been primed to look for, respond to um, danger and threat, then we need to understand how stressors within this new social ecology will play a critical role in determining how a child adjusts. And typically, even after repatriation, the social environment is fraught with stress. We see family strain, financial burden on families, parental mental health problems, acculturative or ideological conflicts with their new setting, bullying in school, there may also be some um, after effects of what they've been through, such as developmental delays, learning delays. Society may stigmatize returning individuals. So across the levels of the social ecology, children may continue to experience their environment as threatening, even after resettlement. And this, in turn, can manifest in a range of maladaptive behaviors. So if you're wondering, okay, fine, not great for the child, but what does this have to do with security? Um, I want to share with you um, a little bit from the research that I've done. Um, like it was mentioned that I have uh, run a longitudinal study of, of these were young Somali adults in the US and Canada. Um, and we followed over a period of six years, both their experiences and also their attitudes and and actions related to a variety of outcomes, including openness to violent extremism. Now, two of the most pre strongest predictors in understanding who would be more likely to endorse an um, openness to um, violent extremism or political violence, um, one of them came from the very outer layer of the social ecology, and that had to do with sense of trust in government and a sense of attachment to the nation in which they were living. And the other had to do with the very center of the social ecology, the individual and the degree of trauma that he or she had experienced. And so I think what this points to is that if we really wanna understand um, why some individuals would perpetrate violence and what we can do to ensure that they don't go on to do that, we can't be focused on any single level of the ecology alone. We instead need to be taking a much more whole of society um, perspective so that we are thinking both about, for instance, addressing trauma, thinking about stigma, trusting government, and those outer layers of the society, and how those relate to each other as an individual develops. So what do we do with repatriation and reintegration? Clearly, for the children we're talking about, trauma must be addressed, but just as clearly to me, addressing trauma without also attending to the larger fabric of the social ecology around them is short-sighted. I believe, and increasingly I'm not alone in thinking this, that the best approach to addressing the multi-level challenges here lay in multidisciplinary teams. This is an approach that North Macedonia has embraced in their national strategy for R&R, &R, and the idea behind it is this. 
to effectively address the multi-layered needs and strengths of returning children and other individuals, you need a multi-actor team that can come together to collaboratively assess and address these needs. Assessment needs to consider psychological, practical, legal, family, developmental, educational, and societal factors. Based on these comprehensive assessments, then you can form individual treatment plans that can address these interrelated and diverse needs and strengths. This kind of approach recognizes that no one sector can hold the solution to this kind of problem, and that a whole of society approach to care uh, provides the most powerful model for successful repatriation and reintegration. And I would argue that just as disruption in any one layer of the social ecology can lead to these negative developmental cascades, it's also true that positive intervention across these different levels of the social ecology can work together to create meaningful, powerful change in a positive direction. Thank you.